Well, it's my great uh, pleasure to introduce our speaker today, who's my accomplished colleague in the political science department, Kadri Carmola. Kadri and I have many overlapping interests, so conversations with her are always a real treat. For those of you who, who were here last week, her presentation, I think, should build on last week's discussion, which is why we intentionally scheduled them back to back. So I'm confident this will work well. Uh, Professor Carmola was educated at the University of California, Berkeley, and at the University of Chicago. She is currently finishing a book under contract with Rutledge titled Private Security Contractors in the Age of New Wars, Risk, Law, and Ethics. Her research, research for this project was generously funded by the Smith Richardson Foundation. That work has already received considerable attention, bringing invitations her way to speak at places like Harvard Law School, uh, the University of California at Berkeley, and at a variety of conferences around the world, including the American Bar Association's Conference on Understanding the Privatization of, of National Security, which took place in Chicago and had uh, Professor Carmola seated next to Blackwater luminaries like Eric Prince. <laughs> she can perhaps tell us a little bit about what that was like. Uh, she's also published several articles, including one on noble lying, justice and intergenerational tension in Plato's Republic. Uh, that was published in Political Theory, which is the top journal in her field. Her talk today will be focused on, I think, one, one chapter of her book project. No, actually, the whole book. Okay, she's going to give us an overview of the whole book even better. And it's titled, Private Military Contractors and Risk Transfer Warfare. Please join me in welcoming Kateri Carmola. Thank you very much, and yeah, I'm going to actually give you a very sort of lightning quick overview of the whole book. The risk chapter is, pro is sort of the, one of the first substantive chapters in the book, but in this talk it's going to actually come second uh, in importance. And yes, I, did, uh, I didn't sit next to Eric Prince from Blackwater, I sat across from him, but I sat next, since we were seated alphabetically around this table, uh, I sat next to Kofor Black, so Black and then Carmola. Um, and so he's their vice president. So I kind of got, you know, when you were together for two days, you get to know someone in a kind of an interesting fashion. But anyway, uh, and Eric Prince, by the way, went to every woman in the room, this will tell you enough about him, went to every woman in the room and offered him a ride on his private jet to see his, the Blackwater training area, uh, which we all promptly denied. <laughs> anyway, we were not interested. So I came to this topic of private military companies um, through a couple of avenues, and I just wanted to explain three of them because they'll come up as sort of themes in this talk today. The first was through the idea of proxy warfare and the problems of using proxy forces on the ground. And I was using this uh, right after 9-11, I started studying the use of special operations forces in Afghanistan and their use of the Northern Alliance forces on the ground as a kind of proxy force. And there I was interested in the levels of responsibility we had for uh, crimes of commission or omission on the ground by those who we were funding and supporting. So initially I saw private military companies as another kind of proxy force, and that uh, has remained sort of through it, a kind of proxy, paramilitary, and rather peripheral force to our boots on the ground. The second thing I've always been interested in is what happens when you have mixed up or ad hoc chains of command, that when organizations mix together, there's these kind of funky ad hoc chains of command that actually occur. And my study of the Abu Ghraib prison uh, problems revealed that what happened there was they mixed a lot of people together from varying different uh, parts of the military and the CIA and private contractors. And what happened then was a kind of informal ad hoc chain of command that allowed certain things. Uh, so those ad hoc chains of command, the idea of proxy warfare, and then way in the back, always since I was an undergraduate and wrote on the idea of ambiguous philosophical concepts in Plato's Republic, it's in book seven, for Murray's sake, uh, I've always been interested in ambiguous concepts in political realms, things that really resist conceptualization. And for this book, I've really been helped by the work of anthropologist Mary Douglas, who works with uh, problematic categories and how they kind of fit. So all of these things come together in the topic of private military companies. What I want to argue about in the sort of outline of my talk is I want to go look at some of the current situation, the problems of the current situation, the consequences, which are primarily in the legal realm uh, for this period of this talk. 
Then I want to back up and look at some of what I see to be some of the unnamed causes uh, for the rise of private military companies, and that's tied to the idea of risk. Third, I want to look into the future and talk about kind of future ethical confusions that result from the use of private military companies. And then I'll end with some basic sort of policy recommendations, sort of my wish list of policy recommendations, and then a very realistic, like the world isn't going to change, so what would I have in that case? Um, so first, what are we talking about here? Again, these, uh, like these ambiguous entities that Mary Douglas focuses on in her work on anthropology, the private military companies are a mixture of types. They're not private entities. They're kind of quasi-public-private partnerships. They're hybrid entities. They're polymorphous. They're ambiguous. I see them as, can I walk away from the microphone? Because I always need to walk around. OK. Um, is that OK? I can yell. So I see them. The one thing that kind of defines my talk repeatedly is this idea of a classic Venn diagram, which sort of explains them. So this makes me stand out as a political scientist or a scholar. I have a Venn diagram. <laughs> and I see three types operating in making what PMCs really are. The first type is the NGO privatized citizen going out to solve a lot of the world's problems, especially in zones of conflict. So there's a lot of NGO speak, the kind of nonprofit privatized citizen uh, operating out in the world that comes up when you talk to these private guys. Practically speaking, a lot of them are engaged in NGO type activities like demining and post conflict resolution and so forth. So they often hang out with the NGO group and see themselves and present themselves as humanitarian actors on the ground. Secondly, they're an off-growth of a military type or a military culture. And third, they're an off-growth of a business culture. These are three very different orientations toward the world. And actually, private military companies are kind of on the periphery of all these different types. But they mix each one of them. So these are the ways in which they're polymorphous. If you meet them within a military setting, they stress all of their military background, the ways in which they can be uh, shoulder to shoulder with the military, a kind of paramilitary force. If you see them within a business context, like I saw at Dartmouth or at Harvard Business School a year and a half ago, they promote the fact that they are one of the top sort of multinational business groups. They employ all these business mechanisms to guard their, or to evaluate their employees and so forth. They're at the kind of height of the contract law, cosmopolitanism, and so forth. So they're, they present themselves as business actors. So this makes it really hard for uh, policymakers to understand what they're looking at. They're hard to analyze. These organizations are hard to pin down. And this makes all of the talk about the need for transparency, which is actually exactly what we need. But transparency is hard when you don't know what you're looking at. You don't really know how you, know, you can expose it, but you don't have a way of classifying what you're exposing. So this is a perplexing reality. Briefly, we've got oftentimes some of these ad hoc mixtures. We have different military types in one organization. They'll hire from different levels within the military. They'll hire from different schools within the military. And then they hire multinational employees who are mixing. They'll mix Ukrainians with South Africans and El Salvadorans, Peruvians. Israelis, they all come together in one organization. So you've got these mixture of national types and then a mixture of what they did in their various militaries, their status in their various militaries. <laughs> Thirdly, the firms themselves are highly fluid. They'll emerge and go back down. They'll reconfigure themselves. They'll create offshore entities. So the firms aren't that stable themselves. It's often like sort of Silicon Valley in the 1990s. There's a lot of competition among firms. And then the firms will reconfigure uh, themselves or remarket themselves in different areas. So everything's very fluid. And then in the midst of these very polymorphous uh, organizations, there's this sort of individual contractor, this individual entity, the, pers the people, many of whom I've interviewed, who see themselves as sort of the ultimate entrepreneurial actor. He can sign up for a contract with this for six months, go back to South Africa for a little while, then go on to Uganda and sign up under this kind of organization, put their money earned offshore in some other country. They, the ultimate kind of individual actor. So importantly, this whole 
polymorphous, problematic, confusing, perplexing reality is happening, I just want to make this as a footnote, or I want to bracket this point, in the midst of a very changing national military and actually global military world. So in the book, I have a whole chapter talking about these new transformations that this transformation is just a little footnote of. And it includes a, a military right now that's struggling with what it's supposed to do. Uh, and Iraq is just the sort of latest incarnation of that. I want to move on to the legal and policy consequences of this amorphous, mixed-up entity in our midst. And I handed around an article about Blackwater on the Blackwater shootings. I'm going to share with your partner there, Mindy. Um, which is just from two days ago, and it really came out uh, perfectly timed. Most of you should know about the shootings that occurred in September where Blackwater employees guarding a convoy of State Department contractors, they were USAID contractors working for the State Department, guarding a, a convoy of them going through the center of Baghdad, opened fire on a number of what they saw to be real threats and turned out to be civilians, killing 17 Iraqis. The problem that comes from this is how to prosecute these State Department contracted Blackwater employees for what kinds of a crime. And that has kind of uh, brought all of these questions about legal regulation to a head in the last fall. Uh, you can see in this article that I've handed around that what the State Department is having trouble doing is accepting the evidence it's gathered from its um, investigation. And if you turn around to the second page, there's all this trouble trying to figure out what kind of federal law is going to apply to these people. And uh, if you look sort of the third paragraph up from the bottom, the signs that justice officials believe they face, significant obstacles in prosecuting Blackwater guards, come as independent human rights group, as an independent human rights group prepared to criticize the Bush administration, blah, blah. So there's two things that happen. One group of people, including the Justice Department in this case, says we are, our hands are tied and there isn't any legal remedy for this particular problem that we can use. At the same time, all sorts of organizations from the very beginning have said there's plenty of law out there that you can use. We're seeing a vacuum in the law or gray areas, but there are strands of law that actually could be used. You'll see Human Rights Group at the very bottom quotes exactly that. Um, if you just look at the second to the last quote, the U.S. government's reaction to the shootings has been characterized by confusion, defensiveness, a multiplicity of uncoordinated ad hoc investigations, and interagency inter finger pointing. These failures underscore the Justice Department's unwillingness, blah, blah. So they actually think it's a kind of policy to not deal with this. So there are three questions that actually come up with the Blackwater scandal and other incidents that have happened similar to this one. And the, interestingly, the three scandals are sim or not the three scandals, the three questions that have come up with regard to Blackwater employees are the same as are surfacing in our attempts to grapple with prisoners or enemy combatants in Guantanamo Bay. So we have terrorists on the one hand, private military contractors on the other, very different types of groups, but they're both ambiguous and hard to classify, and they're both running into three types of legal issues. Number one is their status. What are they, given the laws we have? If you're an unlawful enemy combatant, what body of law is going to apply to you? Similarly, the, and we still don't know what private contractors are. Are they civilians? Are they combatants? That's the most easy uh, way of trying to classify them. Second, we have the question of jurisdiction. How far does the FBI's law and investigatory ability extend into something as ambiguous as Iraq at this moment? And how can we actually investigate? How does our, our own national courts extend their jurisdiction to a place like Iraq? Similarly, is the Supreme Court, does the Supreme Court have jurisdiction in something like Guantanamo Bay? The third problem is evidence and how to treat evidence. And you have opposite ends of the evidence problem. Guantanamo Bay, we don't know how to deal with evidence because people could have been tortured and we're worried about how we define torture, rightly so. The problem with the Blackwater employees is they were granted immunity in order to allow the investigation to go forward. So the investigation now has all of this evidence, but people were granted sort of the opposite of torture. Uh, they were given a carrot in order to give their information rather than a stick being used on them. So that's created problematic legal realms. 
So there actually are these bodies of law which could speak to this issue, and I'd be happy to go over them in question and answer, but I actually think that uh, since the problem has been around for at least 10 years, this is not a new issue, how to regulate these guys, and the fact that it hasn't been addressed well, I second the suspicion that the Human Rights uh, Watch organization quotes in this New York Times article, that what's going on here? What's really happening? There's three usual, I'm a real three person, you'll notice that. Somebody said it's because I was born Catholic and Catholics see God as three, and so we, everything is tripartite. But regardless, there's three ways in which I, uh, it gets really boring when you're reading my book because it's always like there's a three part, three part, there's never a four part. I'm three, oh yeah, three, the fleur de lis, yeah, they're Catholics. Okay, anyway, so there's three ways in which people tend to look at the problem of no regulation despite lots of ways of doing regulation. And I classify them using the idea of hands. There's the many hands theory, there's the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing, and then there's the dirty hands theory. So I'm just kind of giving you those three, and of course I'll act them out like this. So the theory number one is that there are too, what this, a little bit of what the newspaper article was referring to is there's too many agencies involved, too many overlapping arenas of authority, there's all this interagency fighting, who should really regulate these guys? We don't even know who they're employed by, tracking down their, uh, orig the original contracting entity, entity, there's all this kind of fighting, too many chains of commands, too many nationalities, and so forth, it's this many-headed monster. So where this occur, I have what I talked about, you, you usually see what I talked about at the beginning, on the ground, ad hoc chains of command, where the guy who, who took, takes the most steroids, no, just kidding, uh, the biggest guy and with the most usually special operations forces background, even though he's lower in the chain of command that was written up, actually ends up taking a lot of, having a lot of kind of personal power in that case, and situations like that occur. So there's a many-handed model. The second theory is that, and that in fact what we're seeing is just sort of regulatory confusion. There are bodies of law, but no one, everyone's just sort of waiting for someone else to step forward. That's that theory. The right hand, left hand theory says, no, in warfare, actually historically, war, the laws of war have always gone, gone on two tracks. There's the right hand body of law which applies to soldiers and keeps them well within strict chains of command. And then there's kind of the left hand paramilitary forces who are sent out to do the dirty work and then prosecuted and distanced, you distance yourselves from them when the war is over. But there's always a two track system to something like ethics and the laws of war. So paramilitary or peripheral proxy forces are these left handed forces that tend to operate around. In the chapter in which I write about this, I look at different historical examples of whoop, who you would send to the, the most frontier areas of your uh, empire, for instance, the types of forces you would send out to the edge of the Ottoman Empire, for instance, or the edge of the Roman Empire, or even during the Revolutionary War, which kinds of soldiers fought the Indians versus fought the French versus fought the British. So there were always these sort of levels within the laws of war. We have our own peripheral actors within the military, and they're called the Special Operations Forces. Covert operations and those who work under covert operations tend to operate under a different military law rubric than the regular military. So right hand, left hand means we have this one highly regulated group of people within the military, and then there's these less regulated people who sort of do the dirty work. One uh, person I interviewed in Britain said, oh, the British are really good at this, and they called it the sepoy system. They would hire some lowlife to beat up the person they wanted to and then ex never touch the person, torture or whatever, then discover that this had occurred and prosecute them. Um, so this is a long-standing right-hand, left-hand problem. The final theory, which is what also comes up, the dirty hands theory, comes up a lot. There's a kind of conspiracy that, in fact, our administration has got very dirty hands in this process and that we, are, we purposefully went out and created a force that was off the books and under the radar, so to speak, and that nobody could really regulate, and that then we made use of them. So not like this is what naturally happens in war, right hand, left hand, but really kind of a, uh, an explicit policy, dirty hands. My theory is different from these, and it says that in fact what we're looking at takes bits from these different theories, but it's really a clash of legal cultures. What I see going on is a clash of legal cultures. And 
you could sort of see this clash. It's not really, it doesn't really dovetail with this. This was your organizational mixture. But the class of, clash of legal cultures coming in to kind of haunt the security contractor there is human rights law and all of its international, international laws of humanitarian, uh, well, also the law of, international law of armed combat is what I'm trying to say, international humanitarian laws, how it's usually talked about, military law within a national legal structure, and then civilian contract law. And this comes up, what's most interesting about this clash is that I think you have very different legal orientations when you take these different, um, almost I call them almost genealogies of law. These, they have an entire genealogy or history to them. People show up very differently, for instance, as individuals with different kinds of rights, depending on whether they are seen through the lens of international humanitarian law or human rights law, of which the laws of war are underneath. Geneva Conventions and the laws of war actually kind of stand above and are influenced by international humanitarian law and also military law. So there's this amazing relationship there. I've got all these brilliant diagrams that make it fun in the book. Um, here I'm actually just sort of drawing them out for you. So these different legal orientations which can be seen in a domestic scene between, for instance, criminal law and civil law. You move from the realm of civil law into criminal law once a certain kind of crime has been committed, are influencing our attempt to regulate these people. And civil contract law, which includes government in contract law, was not ever really usually meant to inhibit or deal with potentially violent actors. So right now we're using a contract law mechanism to deal with something that never usually falls underneath the realm of contract law. You don't usually ever write it into someone's contract that you're not going to shoot anybody, for instance. It's, it actually comes across rather strangely. The per, let me, I have a, the rubrics that I use to kind of compare military law human rights law and civil contract law, look at the way in which, for instance, in human rights law, the purpose is to protect those who are powerless. You're looking at protecting victims. Within military law, the whole orientation of the Uniform Code of Military Justice, the UCMJ, is about restraining, and, uh, restraining the behavior of those who are quite powerful, that is the military. And civil or contract law enables regulations or enables behavior between two people who are sort of legal equals, who get together and say, if you do X at time Y, I'll pay you Z or something. So you can find these different bodies of law. You can find human rights law, strains of human rights law in our own criminal law code. You can find it in international human rights law. You find military law in the UCMJ. And the UCMJ has a tremendous weight, not just on behavior, but procedure of what will happen when anything goes wrong. It has its own criminal courts. In fact, some people who study military law call the military legal code a pocket republic. It's a strange thing. It's like a, a republic where citizens show up differently within the military than they do outside the military. People have referred to this as the civilian military divide, usually talking about the distance between those who are in the military and those who are in the civilian world. But a lot of scholars, Sam Huntington among them, says actually what you always want to do is create the military as a way of life with its own stricter bodies of laws where individuals have limited rights and so forth to kind of keep control over it. And finally, in the, in the world of civil or contract law, you see contracts, you see government procurement, you see all of those kinds of uh, worlds coming up. And I can harm shows up differently in each of these things, individual actors show up. And this is what I think is clashing when we try and regulate uh, military contractors. So we'll come back up in my recommendations of how to do, uh, how to actually regulate them. So what has been suggested so far is the first one that you might have heard this fall, or last fall, actually. Um, and I think one of our people present here was uh, at the congressional hearings. David Wood was 
present at the congressional hearings about this, was that you would take contractors and you would maneuver them, almost deputize them underneath military law for a specific period of time. You would make them kind of quasi-military actors for a period of like six, for the period of their contract. And then UCMJ would kind of govern them. The military went crazy with this idea because it said, this isn't just a kind of cafeteria style law. You can't just kind of add certain things. UCMJ is a way of life. You know, you enter into it and you are totally within military law uh, and you can't just sort of be out of it in six months. Uh, so that was actually kind of shot down very, very quickly and a number of the conferences I were at where the military were there, they just were despising the idea that you would have UCMJ kind of on order as backup. The second idea was that you would widen another, uh, for another body of law called the Military Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act, which widens, it says that any base that's out there and anyone who's connected to the Department of Defense can be charged as a, can be charged a felon, and commits a felony, can be charged uh, as an actor somewhere abroad connected to the military. So this was MEJA, M-E-J-A, Military Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act. People said we will we'll widen that to include not just Department of Defense contractors, but State Department contractors, of which Blackwater was one of them, and other contractors that are somehow working for the government, so that U.S. criminal law will be extended to people connected vaguely to the military. MEJA was originally came about because uh, two women married to servicemen committed felonies. And so it was the idea that if you were married to someone within the military and you committed a crime, you could be prosecuted as, um, you know, there on the base under U.S. criminal law. So now they're going to extend this to someone like contractors. This has also hit a lot of bumps in the roads. The companies themselves say they would like to use corporate self-regulation and kind of use contract law to regulate themselves the best, that they would write very strict, very detailed contracts saying the minute you commit any crime or misdemeanor, whatever it is, we'll immediately fire you and you'll never be able to be employed again. That has two problems associated with it. I'm getting dry. The one is that for most of these actors, if you're a political scientist, you know you need the game to be replayed played repeatedly in order for it to have any uh, force. So since most of these actors oftentimes are only interested in a one-time game, the threat of further sanctions down the road tends not to mean that much to them. So they'll often go in. One guy said, I go in because my kid's in college and I need to boost my retirement. I'm going to go in for six months and then I'm out. It really don't, doesn't matter what happens there. So the issue of not being hired again doesn't necessarily work. Secondly, what you're basically saying is the punishment for committing a crime abroad is, a, is, is that your contract will be up and you will be fired and sent home immediately and that's basically what's been happening. So industry self-regulation uh, doesn't usually work because so far, and this will come up in my recommendations, the crimes of those committed within an organization tends not to affect the organization itself, tends only to affect the individual. The British organization charged with regulating private military companies called the British Association for Private Security Companies is run by a man who, who Andy Barrick Park is his name, he has this idea in which you need matrices of regulation. He says his daughter who's in her 20s suggested that word. But in fact what you need is layers and matrices of regulations to govern them because in fact they are these polymorphous uh, figures. They need some state regulations, they need some international regulations, they need some corporate regulations. You actually have to mix them all together. He says you fight a mixture by using a mixture of regulatory tools. I actually think this won't work precisely because, at least historically, it won't work for armed security contractors precisely because historically we have always decided that those who bear arms can't have a multi, they have to be seen in kind of unidimensional forms. They have to be seen either as a state actor or as a, somehow an illegal bearer of weapons. So it's very hard to take someone who's bearing arms in the service of a corporation or a governmental entity or the military and say that they're going to have a matrix of regulations applying to them. There actually needs to be a hierarchy of regulations, not a sort of matrix. 
we're behind or ahead in that clock? Okay, so we're around noon or around one. Good. So let me step back from this issue of the consequences, the legal consequences, and very briefly touch on what I see to be one of the causes, the under, uh, under-analyzed causes of the increase in these private firms. And that is the idea of risk and the idea of the risk society. In the book, I argue that in order to really understand this phenomenon, you have to see them as actors within what's been called a new economy of risk. That's as social theorist Ulrich Beck put it. We live in an economy of risk. The usual theories use a kind of supply and demand rubric. There was a great supply of unemployed military people during the 1990s, and there was a demand for all kinds of forces that could be used without instituting a draft. So they talk about supply and demand language. I'm talking about the economy in which that supply and demand theory works. So the economy of risk is where something like, it's kind of like carbon credits. Risk itself is bought and traded and so forth. There's a complicated uh, story to this, but it has something to do with the fact that we now see risk as something that can be quantified, something that can be evaluated. You can do a cost evaluation of what your risk is on one thing. You can lower your risk in one area and heighten your opportunity in another area that risk is something that can be classified and quantified and that you can take individual actors and put them into a kind of, uh, sort of mathematical formula of risk reduction or risk assessment. PMCs, private military companies, are involved in the risk economy in three ways. The first is very practical. At the beginning of the, many of the beginning of these firms occurred, many of these firms were founded and began when ins- very large insurance companies started uh, allowing for kidnap and ransom insurance, started providing kidnap and ransom insurance to CEOs working abroad in dangerous zones. What they would do is say, we, uh, if one of your CEOs is kidnapped, you can, we have a company associated with, let's say, Lloyd's of London, which is the common one, that will negotiate with the kidnappers, that will rescue the person, that will uh, bargain down the ransom needed for this particularly wealthy CEO, and you can take out a policy for risk, uh, kidnap and risk insurance. This grew to, uh, there's always been something called political risk insurance or terrorism risk insurance, but it gradually grew to take advantage of the fact that if you hired a private military company as a corporation, for instance, you could lower the cost of your political or terrorism or kidnap and ransom risk insurance. So a large part of this chapter actually deals with the changes within the global insurance industry uh, that made the use of private military companies uh, almost a necessity for anyone operating in places like Baghdad. So, for instance, one of the firms I interviewed called AKE, their offices are located inside the horribly ugly Lloyd's of London building in the city of London. And they work for journalistic organizations and NGOs who, in order to send people to risky places, need to take out risk insurance for those uh, kind of, uh, sometimes it's called evacuation insurance, that they will be evacuated or they will be protected, sort of security insurance. And these guys worked as bodyguards for them in order to, partly in order to lower the cost of having them, uh, these organizations, oftentimes news organizations, send people abroad. So they they were involved in actually the risk industry in that very practical way. The second way in which they're involved in, we're on threes again, the second way in which Uh, PMCs are involved in this risk economy is that they figure very much in the military's idea of what's called, and was the title of my talk, risk transfer warfare, where you can transfer risks onto less politically problematic figures in order to protect your soldiers from dying and from, uh, it's it's done very uh, cost-based analysis. They say, so-and-so costs this amount of money, If he's injured, he will cost this amount of money at Walter Reed. His insurance benefits for the rest of his life or however long he's with the Veterans Association, which goes to your death, will cost this amount of money. If we hire a contractor, he will expose us to less risk politically. He'll be uh, less newsworthy, so to speak, but he'll also be cheaper. And so we we can transfer some of the risk of these foreign policies onto these figures. That's the risk transfer warfare theory. 
And finally, they fit within the third idea of the risk culture, is that they fit in this rather spooked and uh, fearful, it's what someone calls the age of anxiety, that we're, we're incredibly anxious despite quite a lot of security, and that having, everyone having their own sort of private Israeli bodyguard, which is the new, um, sort of the new thing to purchase, uh, and that your own physical security has to be kind of guaranteed in a privatized way is definitely part of our larger risk society. And if you read social theorist Anthony Giddens on the subject, he says when you have a risk society, and there are tremendous risks that are always uh, on your radar, what you tend to have kind of following along with that will be a revert a fallback on a certain notion of trust. Risk economies are always based on an idea of trust, and I'm just going to throw that out there and not go much further than that, except for if you look in these private military companies, they say, we're small enough, we it's all about trust mechanisms. We all know each other. It's, there's really, we don't really need any sort of outside bureaucratic regulation because we all know each other and we all trust each other. In the last five minutes, I want to talk about the confusions of ethical language that uh, the future of this, uh, that are sort of exposed when we look at private military companies. And there you have to step back and say, what's the overarching purpose, the overarching end to have private military forces like this? It may be caused by our conceptions of risk and this risk economy, and it may have serious consequences in the legal realm, but overall, what's the real purpose? This is kind of the moral and ethical question that I think has to undergird and provide ballast for this kind of policy. We don't really know where we're going and why we're going this particular direction because we haven't asked these questions. It's strange, really, that in the zone of warfare, and people who've taken my ethics in war have heard this a million times, it's very strange that the language of ethics and justice comes up so much in this realm that's all about violence and destruction. It's, it's a very strange aspect of studying warfare that you're always raising questions that have to do with ethics and justice in the midst of this kind of a realm. It has its beginnings, the idea of speaking ethically about destruction, has its beginnings, <coughs> I argue, in an attempt to make something completely unforgivable, destroying things, raping and pillaging, killing women, and so forth, or killing other combatants, or total destruction. It has its beginnings in the attempt to make that kind of behavior into something that ultimately could be forgiven. That ethics and warfare is all about returning the combatant back to society and having them be accepted in some way. Someone once said, and I, I tried to Google it to find the right person, but war's biggest problems is its veterans. And I don't know who said it, but it wasn't me. Someone once said, war's biggest problems is its veterans. And I think we know from early on, it was the return of these veterans, even in Thucydides, the veterans of the Peloponnesian War turned into mercenaries for following wars. They couldn't be accepted back in the society. So ethics and warfare often has to do with that need to make certain kinds of nominally unforgivable actions, somehow forgivable and understandable. The ethical language that surrounds the breach of a contract is extremely different from the long-standing way in which ethics shows up within the military. In the chapter, I use a rubric invented by Ken Jowett, my former professor at Berkeley, who talks about ethics of frontiers. He doesn't talk about ethics. He talks about frontier worlds, barricaded worlds, and worlds of boundaries. And very briefly, a frontier is exactly what it sounds like. It's like the Western frontier. There's no law and order, nothing. A barricaded world is like the military. You're barricaded on a base. You're very much concerned with who's in, who's out. And a world of borders is a place that's like the contracting world. You can kind of be in for a little while, then out and for a little while, and so forth. And I apply that to the ways in which ethics shows up in these different worlds. and the way in which money shows up in all of these different worlds and so forth. So I'm going to skip ahead to my recommendations. All this talk about the military brings home the point that we don't understand this changing organization, which is the military. It's astounding to me how in political science departments, no one, including myself, really studies, teaches a course on the military as an organization within our country and around the world. <clears throat> 
Perhaps the world of the military is kind of dying out, and maybe this loss should not be mourned, because if we look back to the 20th century, state-based large militaries wreaked a tremendous amount of havoc. So, you know, speaking about kind of character and honor and duty and obligation within the military uh, in the face of something like Abu Ghraib seems, you know, rather strange or quaint to uh, quote Alberto Gonzalez. But the one thing that the military is that these guys are not is something that is fully ours as a democracy. There is this civilian military divide, but it is nothing, I would say, compared to what the divide is between the civilian world and the contracting world. So my best solutions, and here I agree totally with Allison, we agree with each other, that we should ban all armed contractors. You should never be able to operate abroad carrying a weapon and be some privatized citizen. Just total ban. If you need the presence of armed security in another country, you need to beef up what we already have, which is the diplomatic security services as an arm of the State Department that guards diplomats abroad. And right now it's seen as a weak and kind of pathetic organization, so you just need to beef it up, train those people better. And if you can't get enough armed security through the military and through the reserves, temporarily deployed, without reinstituting a draft, then you need to either rethink the draft or reinstitute your, or rethink your mission. People know that I'm all for national service and that you would go to national service and you'd have your choice to do the military or do environmental or other kinds of service, poverty reduction, so forth. You also need to allow, there are other types of contractors than non-armed contractors and I'm going to skip my recommendations for them, except for the, to mention that most military officers trained by these uh, contractors who are sort of on training missions with other militaries, most other militaries that I've seen have complete contempt for the employees, for instance, of military professional resources who are ex-military guys training other militaries. The next best solution to uh, my kind of pipe dream above that was ban all armed contractors, one of my colleagues at the London School of Economics, Christopher Coker, said, it's all contracts now, Katerie, you know, like get with it. Like there's nothing but contracts now. You're in, living in a world of the past. So, at a minimum, you would need a kind of licensing, a very strict kind of licensing regime, kind of like McArdle's idea for a drinking license. Um, and it would be enforced through various uh, extensions of kind of FBI jurisdiction to places to kind of keep people's <coughs> license observed. You would need whistleblowers, you would need NGOs tasked with watching these people, and so forth. It can be revoked you can be charged with abusing your license. You would also need to make firms financially responsible, that is open to um, tort liability, alien tort liability, for the actions of all of their members, regardless of the nationality of their member. You need to expand tort law and alien tort statutes. And finally, you would need to calculate the true cost of these guys. If you're gonna do a risk economy cost benefit analysis, you have to look at the true cost of them not just the dollar cost on the ground per day, but the extended cost of their training, the medical costs when they come home, the death benefits, uh, and so forth. Thank you very much. I appreciate your patience listening. We have, we have plenty of time for questions now. My colleague, Bert Johnson. Of government in pursuing its action with respect to contractors. Um, with the clash of legal cultures, I was for a little bit uh, confused about what the motive is, mm. um, but I take it that the motive is banishing risk. Mm. Is that, is that correct? No, the, the, the earlier motive, government's motive, is risk reduction in that case. Um, so if it was a conscious effort to have these many hands or dirty hands or something like that, their idea is they're going to they're gonna reduce the risk of their policies abroad. Yeah. 
And then the earlier thing of these, dif these different types is just what has occurred and why it's so hard to analyze or call for something like transparency because we don't know what we're looking at. Well, you're pu pushing together, my first answer is, well, you're pushing together two chapters which actually are very different, the legal world and the risk world. One is, one is actually a, a kind of economic world. When you see risk and you look at, sorry, risk, um, and it's hard to overlay on top of that the world of sort of legal problems. So if, if we, if in one of the things in my legal chapter is I lay out these different legal genealogies or different legal ways of seeing the world. It's very hard to, the, way, the only way in which the risk language comes into that is in the contract, actually in contract law. So you, uh, in order to minim, and it's classic principal agent problems, um, that you, in order to minimize your risk of having an agent carry out your actions, you write a very detailed contract that says if the following things don't occur, uh, we'll break off our relationship. So the risk economy idea does come into kind of contract law, but it doesn't fit at all with the other two ways of law. Does that make sense? I'm just wondering if the Keep going. about the law is part of what makes it such an effective means of risk management. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's kind of create, people call that creative non-compliance that you have a confusion out there that makes it easier for you to um, not do anything because you can always kind of blame that there are these many hands out there and you're not really which way to sh If those of you who know Ophelia Eglin's paper on the British policy of non-decision, I see that as very similar, um, people who were at her paper talk. So it's a kind of policy of non-decision. You're going to wait and let many hands kind of get involved and see what emerges. You can either make it an unconscious policy, we tried our best and it's just too confusing, or you could make it a kind of conspiracy. Lots of people are saying this is a conspiracy to actually stand back and not get involved in something that's very serious. And it's only really the second one that can be seen as kind of a risk reduction. Does that help you? Uh, a non-colleague. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, we know that our guys are being drilled over there. These fellows fired at those uh, at, at, in the civilians uh, because they feared something. I'm wondering if the audience is interested in how many people can get hurt. And also, I mean, how many civilian deaths there have been know, due to contractors? Of the Black Lord people, for example, they, they're the guys who done it. How many casualties have they taken on? Yeah. I haven't heard much about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Also, uh, and I know uh, that if you are uh, in the military, you can't get health care, for example. This gets taken care of in another way, which seemed to me, the point of that seemed to me to make it affordable. Mm -hmm. Which makes these guys get hurt and it's very expensive to put them back together again. Uh, and you mean so to hire contractors makes you have to pay less, than, less for health benefits? I yeah. Think it's the other way. I, mm. think, I think the soldiers are the cheaper option, and that's mm. what the military is in part all about, so you can actually afford it. Mm. It is very expensive. If you bring in these, this is why one of my recommendations, you have to look at the true cost, and one of the true costs is going to have their mental health, their physical health taken into consideration, um, but also all the insurance policies that we give. Uh, to the military should be, you know, kind of brought in. But you're bringing up the insurance industry in two ways. In my, in my talk, one of the things I wanted to say was how the insurance in industry promotes the use of private contractors. And also serves, interestingly enough, there's a second part, which it also serves to regulate them. Because um, 
let me kind of just bracket that for a second. The second way is that private contractors are risking their lives. They are dying in the line of duty. And that was one of the things that Eric Prince from Blackwater kept repeating when he testified before Congress in October. Um, we have, none of our, the people we're guarding have died. Uh, none of the employees were died. And we have actually taken casualties. Uh, and there's a whole subset of interesting things, which is how the contractors deal with casualties as opposed to how the military deals with casualties, mm -hmm. how they honor them, who goes to the funerals, how the bodies are flown back. That's all rather interesting, too. But they are taking a lot of risks. And, well, I, could, I don't want to go down a, another trail of thought on that. Um, but you're talking about sort of three different things. One is how much risk are the contractors taking on? And it's actually a lot of times quite a bit. Um, the second one is the involvement of the insurance um, agencies in this. One, just one tiny story that will kind of give you the example. Armor Group, who I've interviewed quite a lot of times, has an insurance company that covers their guys on the ground. And they didn't, because if you know anything about the insurance industry, which I've been learning a lot about, there's never been anything like this before to insure. So they don't, the underwriters don't know how to create a formula to address the risk of the guys on the ground in Baghdad. So they sit down and they make up their own formula, which was, we've driven this many miles, and we've hit these many roadside bombs, and we've lost these many people over this, many, this much time. E each month we drive 4,000 miles, four roadside bombs, one half a casualty, something like that. And each month they can bring that down, their insurance goes down. So they created their own formulas to actually kind of address the risk that they were undergoing. Um, and it, because they have a certain calculation of risk, and the military has a certain calculation of risk, um, that's just another way in which these things get uh, kind of clashes. For instance, Blackwater says, the main point of my job is to guard person A from point B to point C. And my mission is successful if this person gets from here to here, period. And the risk that I'm looking at, the way in which I define risk is, do I survive and does he survive? Or the you know, State Department employee that I'm guarding. The military has a, real, a much bigger mission that it's trying to do. Ostensibly, it's kind of engaged right now in counterinsurgency, which means it reduces its actions in certain ways and ups its actions in other ways. Uh, so there's those different conceptions as well. That's too long of an answer to your well, question. Giving it to the American there's varying ways in which it gets paid for. Um, private entities, public entities, some companies are big, they say we self-insure, it's too expensive to get an insurance. So Blackwater, for instance, insures itself. So that gets into the complications of the insurance industry. Yeah, Chris. Yeah, I have a two-part question, because I'm not sure three or more. I'll add a third part. <laughs> First, um, in terms of thinking about the ambiguity of these You Protestant? No. <laughs> No, no, keep going. Okay, if, if it is a new problem, why is it a new problem? Why, why didn't we look to these folks in 1970 Vietnam or mm. Southeast Asia? If it's not a new problem, could you just give some examples of some other times mm -hmm. and places where we've had this kind of ambiguity? Yeah, this is one thing that the, the organization that promotes contractors with the odd name of the International Peace Operators Association, they always want to say this has been around forever. We've always had contractors on the ground, especially, but usually what they're saying is logistics or pilots that they're in, or advisors. They're never talking about armed contractors on the ground. So that's really the big difference. So one difference is the type. Another difference is the magnitude of their forces on the ground. And the kind of oft-quoted thing is that in the Gulf War, we had 10 military to one contractor. Now we have, am I going to get this right? Yeah, for every 100 military people, we, no, I'm going to get a, you, you know this one, the ratio of, of military to contractors has gone up by a, four, by a number of 10. So if we had one to for every 100, we now have 10 for every 100. Okay. There you go. Well, so it's why, definitely expanded. Why are we having the armed contractors today rather than 1970 There's, yeah. It's a bigger method, not a bigger method. Yep, it's a great question. One issue is the military itself, which then had the draft and now doesn't, so the military is smaller. Second idea is we're engaging, because of the counterinsurgency kind of war we're, we're fighting, we're engaging in reconstruction at the exact same time as we're also fighting it. 
So you, ha you have State Department officials, NGOs, all of these things on the ground together. Ne and there are all, there are a lot of those are the uh, people who are, being, who are hiring private contractors. The military is not saying we are responsible for any member of the American government on the ground. You have to hire a private contractor. So none of these address the sort of conspiracy theories of these companies are founded by people, they're making a great profit, and there's a desire to kind of actually boost the profits of those companies. I'm not getting to those. I'm just sort of dealing with the reality itself. Does that help? Yeah, although I think we were doing the same thing with Vietnam, but maybe the military was, was protecting those companies. Yes, but we weren't engaged in the jungle with reconstruction. I mean, they were... Yeah, there were, even though the battle lines were fuzzy there, they're much more fuzzy in Baghdad. Yes? You suggested the legal mechanism of licensing as a means of controlling the private contractor. But then you mentioned uh, the, uh, the special forces are used for uh, these uh, dirty jobs, and then they, it's deniable later. And many people believe that the Bush administration has repealed the Constitution effectively de facto. Mm. And uh, some people believe that it was the private contractor that did the controlled demolition of the World Trade Center in order to get this whole thing started. Well, I don't believe that. <laughs> well, with all this so. legal activity, how are you going to control it with a legal mechanism such as licensing when it's just denial? Well, that gets to, that's a really conspiratorial way of looking at it, and I'm kind of, I'm, I step back from that. I actually believe the World Trade Center had guys flying into it and so forth. Um, how you control the... the my sort of minimal way of controlling them was to work within the language that the government's currently using, which is to say, let's use contract mechanisms, let's use these mechanisms within the private world that have kind of worked within the business model, and let's have uh, these guys be, so I'm saying let's go further and have them be licensed, just like you have to be licensed by the SEC to be a stockbroker. So I'm sort of making a much smaller recommendation. You're asking, the bigger question you're asking is how do you bring law in any way, shape, or form into an administration which you think is leaving law way behind? Um, and I would just say regimes change. You know, there's going to be a change in regime and law is going to have to kind of come back in in some way. Yeah. Another response seems to be that <laughs> one of the benefits of granting immunity in this Blackwater affair is that we will learn what happened. It seems to me that <clears throat> the more serious question would be either whether we should be using private military contractors or if we're going to, um, there's a better way to do it. Um, I, I would like to just press you on the larger question. And I don't necessarily, maybe this is being the devil's advocate or maybe it's just trying to flesh out the argument. Your preferred position is that we never use military contractors and that we uh, either institute a draft or contract our objective. And certainly, if your answer to Chris is correct, notwithstanding Chris's uh, remarks about Vietnam, maybe the lesson is regime change is so difficult that you know, there ought to be a very high burden to justify ever trying to do it. But here would be, in brief, my sort of defense. And the, the first point would be the defense of? Defense of using mili uh, private mm, okay. contractors, just to sketch it out. First, I just raised the question in general, well, isn't this an aspect of collateral damage and haven't we always had it? Uh, our own military have, have killed innocent civilians. Isn't that inherently a problem of war? And that would point towards, first of all, finding out, is there more of it with private contractors than with our own military? If so, what can we do about it? Mm -hmm. Now, as far as law in the mixed case, um, we may just have to live with mixed cases. The mm -hmm. corporation is a mixed case. Mm -hmm. Critics of the corporation are unhappy about that, but also seems to be a core of liberal capitalism. Um, and on the law point, you mentioned international law and the demands of international law. And I'm reminded of two things. One, uh, Jack Goldsmith's book, The Terror Presidency. This is now the, the conservative lawyer inside the administration who resigned after about six or eight months uh, because he kept sort of butting heads with uh, the uh, vice president's lawyer and, uh, and John Yu thought that things were being done in a sloppy and unnecessary manner. Um, but in, in his account, in his book, he said, among other things, uh, that it's much harder to wage a war in the United States successfully now than it was under FDR, that law is impinging on mm -hmm. 
military decisions much more. His example, one of his dramatic examples was Osama bin Laden. You know? okay. At the time when reportedly we knew where he was, but we didn't, you know, it took too long to get the okay to go okay. after him. Okay. Um, that's at least, it seems to me, an interesting aspect of what I see in George Kennan's critique of the legalistic, moralistic mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. That is, raises a question whether it's, um, whether you can push too much on the use of law with respect to the military, uh, with respect to war. And, and then I, I guess that dovetail, dovetails with my final remark. You suggest that there's an inherent conflict between ethics and war. Did I get that right? Because it's always strange to find it, but no, I don't, I don't find inherent conflict, but it's always strange I mean, there to find would, I would, and this, I, as I think this point, I confess I think of Machiavelli. Uh, that the source of, I don't think the source of the problem can be found in the same way in the Greeks and the Romans. I think that's our religion, all right? Uh, our religion, <laughs> biblical religion, predominantly Christianity, uh, that shapes our understanding in such a way that the use of force that kills other people, mm -hmm. that's somehow prima facie wrong, and then you've got to try to work at justifying mm -hmm. it. I don't think you're arguing for a pacifism. No. So it gets us back, I would say, um, the, the sort of side of the angel's position here uh, never use military contractors is okay as long as we're satisfied with the consequences. And I think they're going to mean, practically speaking, that we'll be able to carry out a satisfactory foreign policy without a draft. Because I don't think we're going to get a draft. You know, there isn't consent for that. Now, you know, for those that have a sort of restricted view of what we should be doing in the world, you'd say, hey, so what? What's the problem? <laughs> but for others, that seems to me to be at least a legitimate question. And I guess that's where I'd end up saying, and maybe you would agree with this, but maybe not, uh, uh, the, the first choice should be to try to make sure that we're more careful about when we get into wars like this, and we're more careful about the use of these private contractors. But I'd also want to know, you see, uh, are there more cases of collateral damage with them or than, than with our military? That, that was more than one question, but I'm just trying to Yeah, it's like seven. Really <laughs> but it's the case for saying that uh, the thing isn't completely broken, necessarily and that maybe it's a matter of incremental mm -hmm. uh, change. I wonder what you, if you could respond to that. It's past 1.30. Mm -hmm. Quick response. And then a quick response. I, have, I actually have no problems with sort of mixed categories, but I think we have to see them as mixed categories. And then my answer would be that we have to kind of either create a new body of law which addresses these people, to see them as new actors which require a whole new legal way of looking at it. And there was a part of your question that... Uh, that kind of responded to, yeah. but that certainly you can't, and that, but that you can't just kind of use more detailed contracts to uh, confine or regulate the behavior of these people. Um, that I actually do believe that, and this was true for the Greeks as well as for the Christians. That it, soldiering is a way of life, and it really is a kind of a very different way of life that has very different ideas, and you can't just sort of be. Um, kind of maneuvered into that world. I'm going to stop there because I, I, I like ending on time. Yeah, but you and I have more to talk about. Thank you.